and so this guy okay so um so we can get started so it's my um actually honor to um have professor jimmy chang uh, present today's energy seminar uh, Professor Chang um, did his PhD um, in 1999 at Carnegie Mellon University, where he worked on a really interesting problem related to the cathodes of um, lithium battery. In particular, developing a version of the lithium ion phosphate cathode um, that was extremely low cost and high performing. Now, after um, his time at Carnegie Mellon, he basically um, decided to do a postdoc, and in 2003 became an adjunct professor in the mechanical engineering department at Cornell. So he's been with us now for um, almost as long as I've been here. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a quite a long time. He's quite been on the time. faculty. And in 2011, um, took on a similar status in the uh, material science and engineering department. Now, he is unique, I think, um, probably in the world, in terms of his ability to think across scales and his experience, essentially building batteries all the way from the nitty-gritty stuff having to do with how you design materials for battery electrodes to building components and then integrating those in systems <laughs> and then finding companies that are interested in actually demonstrating this at scale. And so he has tremendous knowledge about... Um, aspects of um, battery um, development and manufacturing that I hope some of it comes through um, in today's lecture. Now, he and his brother, I think, uh, founded a company to do some of this work called Chang's Ascending that is based in Taiwan. And this company is um, one of the few battery startups that actually had an IPO. So they had an IPO in 2013. So he's also seen the kind of business end of batteries in a way that a uh, few of us have. So it's my pleasure to have him today, and I look forward to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Archer. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Jimmy Chang, and it's my pleasure to be here sharing my work with you, and uh, 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 a lot of appreciations from Professor Archer, who invited me, and uh, it's really my pleasure. So today I'll um, talk a little bit on the uh, energy storage system. I make this presentation a little bit uh, uh, comprehensive and, and, and maybe interactive. So if you guys do have a, any questions, please feel free just ask when I'm pre presenting the work. So um, there are two parts of today's story. The first one is the uh, high power energy backup system. So the high power backup system I'm talking about is a 550 volt of system, and the uh, peak current is about 1500 amp kind of system. And um, how does it work, the structure of the system, and the criteria for the battery system and the essential elements will be covered in part one. And part two will be the uh, home energy saving systems. And um, the home energy saving systems is uh, one of the uh, uh, future need, actually, is ongoing issue. How does it work? And talk a little bit of uh, hybrid vehicle. That's the project I had at Cornell back in 2010. And uh, three modes of operations um, I'll be introducing. And combine them, there will be a new uh, approach to future sustainable uh, systems. That is the combination of uh, maybe from PV, from turbine, plus battery storage, and the steady state engine for uh, some short time use. So this is the uh, system uh, I, I'm talking about. Uh, for this high power UPS systems, it's, it comprises the, uh, the battery cells. And then battery cells, you, make, you stack them and then put them in the uh, case that is called the battery module. And eventually you put those modules together in the cabinet to form a system. It looks pretty straightforward and simple, but actually a lot of um, precautions and a lot of, uh, when, when things are related to safety, nobody wants to run the risk. And that forms the uh, topic of today's uh, 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 presentation. So how does it work? So basically, uh, um, these are the, uh, the battery modules. They're connected in series. And then uh, many of them will be in parallel. Um, and then uh, uh, if, if there are any 
um, OC, the, that's OC stands for overcharging, over discharging, or any temperature issues, or anything wrong. Um, and then uh, it, it's going to send the analog systems to the systems and then to the UPS. And then uh, there will be a separate monitoring system, and that is uh, um, uh, to be optional for the users. And this is the basic archi architecture of uh, this system. And now this is the criteria for uh, the success uh, of high power energy backup system. And as I said, pointed out just now, safety is no bargain. It's uh, one of the uh, most important features. Um, let me, why safety is so critical? Imagine that this whole system will be uh, installed in some, let's say, high tech uh, uh, companies like semiconductor industries. They cannot run any risk of uh, any power dip or power sack. Um, that's very critical. And furthermore, if there are safety problems, uh, the fabs are right above and it's going to cause some immediate damage. So nobody wants to run the risk. So there is no bargain. Safety is one of the uh, most important issue. No safety, no product, no business, nothing. And then uh, there should be some performance uh, criteria. That is low voltage drop at high rate discharge. And why high rate is needed? Because uh, you want something uh, that has smaller footprint, smaller space, and then uh, trouble-free, et cetera. Um, you don't want to waste too much space, too much money in investing something use, useless that's standing there, right? So you want a small, uh, as small as possible battery systems or energy backup systems that can make them utilize their space uh, in a more proper way. So high rate is becoming important in that sense. And of course, when you are under high rate, there could be some safety problems, right? So that's uh, the uh, difficulty uh, of, uh, of uh, the situation. And then uh, the uh, operation without air conditioning. Um, this is critical. Um, people probably do not know that as a batteries, that's conventionally used for high power UPS applications. They need air conditioning to keep them cool. If they do not do that, the battery will die. Uh, very rapidly because of ev evaporation of the electrolytes. Um, every 10 degrees is going to deteriorate its life about 50%. So used to be air conditioning and the air conditioning is like 22 degrees Celsius uh, in temperature. So it's pretty low, pretty chilly uh, environment or even lower. So Without air conditioning, that is going to save a lot of money. So this is one of the uh, big criteria for the future batteries. And then uh, talk about a system that's uh, good for partial replacements because uh, this whole system is looking for 20 years of uh, system life. So partial replacement, that means if something is not as good and that can be uh, partially replaced instead of uh, replacing the whole system that's very expensive and not economical. Lastly, uh, that's the affordable price, stable su supply, and then uh, has to be environmentally benign and recyclable. And all these issues form the criteria, then that's what I'm going to cover for part one. Um, so talking about the uh, safety, the very first demo, there will be four experiments I'm going to show, and this is the very first one. That is a short circuit condition. So short circuit condition is, um, well, basically, it's positive and negative. You combine them together. That's the short uh, condition. But for these uh, lithium-iron uh, batteries, they do not allow you to do that because internal resistance is too small. So when you connect the positive and negative, the uh, big current is going to cause uh, some burning. And, and that is going to burn the terminals. You can't even <laughs> conduct the experiment. So it has to be connected with a very small uh, um, uh, of resistance, and in this case, it's 20 mini ohm. And in some UL or some standards, the standard is about 80 uh, mini ohm, but this is uh, smaller. And this is a typical uh, safety test field. And let me show one video. It's a little bit boring because nothing happened. In the beginning, it's uh, 35.7 
in temperature. Um, so when it is shorting, the uh, current is 600 amp for this small box. Um, and then uh, um, now the temperature is increasing. See, it's small in the sense in comparison to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the multimeter. It's pretty small, actually. Um, and then so nothing happened. What you can see is that the temperature is increasing. And then uh, current is remaining 600. OK, now it's repeating. So basically, from the beginning to the end, um, nothing really happened. And this is the data. So in the beginning, it was 600 degree Celsius, and then uh, stars shorting. So the voltage, uh, the blue is the voltage. Voltage after um, about 10 minutes, and, and, and it starts to decrease, and uh, the uh, uh, module temperature is about 62 degree Celsius. That means during these shorting conditions, um, no major energy release other than the energy that is stored in the battery has been released. And the second uh, experiment is the, we call it force discharge. So the force discharge is the same as the uh, um, uh, as, a, uh, as the uh, short circuit um, experiment, except one of the battery cell was initially discharged to zero in voltage. So when you connect the positive and the negative and shorting, while shorting, then the zero capacity battery it will be, will be uh, reverse charged. And during this condition, a lot of uh, heat will be generated. And so I'm not going to, sh and of, of course, um, the safety test was very successful and nothing happened. I'm not going to repeat those boring uh, 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 videos. And i uh, just go skip that and, and just talk about uh, this result. So initially, the current was 600, and then uh, it ramps up to 700 because, uh, because one of the battery cells is reversed in polarity. So there is a big uh, uh, voltage and then uh, again, it's a shorting and nothing happened and the maximum temperature is 75 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, in some batteries, um, especially it's layer structured uh, uh, batteries, when you reverse polarity, a lot of heat will be generated and that is going to trigger some so-called thermal runaway, means uncontrolled uh, condition. So, so it passes. And the third is the uh, safety test is called it abnormal overcharge. So basically, uh, you charge the battery module with uh, uh, two C in C rate. So that means uh, if it's uh, 50 amp hour, you use 100 amp in charging the battery. And still, again, it's uh, the temperature is not going too high. And during the charging, eventually, just uh, uh, the uh, current drops down, and voltage remains. There is no apparent. Um, um, damage to the the, uh, the the battery box, and the fourth is the uh, we call it abusive. So this is a very dangerous experiment because you pretty much you charge the battery to double its voltage. So a 28 volt of battery, you charge it to 56. So that means if it's a four volt uh, lithium ion cells, you double its voltage in charging. So um, and uh, I'm very happy to tell you that um, the uh, so this is the uh, uh, charging current and basically nothing happened and uh, the temperature remains uh, under 100 degrees Celsius and in the end uh, the current drops down to zero and voltage remains at 56 uh, degrees Celsius. So these safety tests we normally demo to the customers. Uh, um, uh, for people who are going to use these batteries for their big systems. And um, there is no compete of uh, other battery systems so far. So um, this is uh, the part I would like to address. And before going into the second uh, criteria, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what is the uh, C rate uh, to remind everybody, uh, maybe some of you already know. Um, so capacity is M hour. 
uh, and energy is what hour. I think this is easier to understand. Power is I times V. And in terms of rate capability, the C rate, um, we, C rate means the current needed to charge or discharge the nominal capacity of the battery. So for example, a battery with nominal capacity of one amp hour, one C rate means current of one A, one amp, that is needed to charge or discharge uh, in one hour. So C over two means current is half. So what is two C? That means double, okay? So this is just a, uh, before that, uh, before the introduction of this rate capability. So this battery module, um, when it is discharged, um, so at one C, C the uh, voltage from the beginning to the end, um, let's say at 80 to 90%, there is a voltage drop of uh, less than one volt uh, for just one C, okay, in one hour. Um, so the capacity is about 50 m hour. And then uh, when you discharge a higher C rate, so people can see is uh, 2C, 3C, 4C to this 11C. So there is a, a, a voltage that's dropping, and that is because of uh, the internal resistance of the battery itself. So, um, so 11C still remain uh, above uh, uh, 21 volt. Uh, let me, I'll do some comparisons later. But this is the uh, rate capability. Um, and this is the, the rate capability of this battery of uh, 1C that discharged in one hour. So uh, this is time that's required. And to 11C, that is uh, about five. So about five minutes. So 11C, uh, if it's 12C, that means 60 divided by 12, it's, it should be five minutes. So the battery uh, can be uh, uh, drained uh, fully uh, in those kind of uh, uh, capabilities. So you depleted the uh, energy in five minutes. And uh, so that is pretty much close to explosion. And the current is 550 amp already for the battery box. So it's already a, a, a very big current that's uh, passing through the, uh, uh, the, the, the battery box itself. And uh, there is one issue that is uh, the layer structure material. And of course, I will introduce more about the materials and what determines uh, of uh, these uh, uh, safety characteristics. Um, this is a, uh, uh, we call it a M NMC, it's nickel manganese cobalt layer structure materials, uh, batteries. Um, this is from Panasonic. And so the green is the 1C rate and the, the blue is 2C rate. So two things I would like to mention about. That is uh, when the battery is full, it's close to four volt. And at the end of the discharge, it's about three volt. So one cell already give you about one point, well, about one volt of, uh, of of uh, the uh, uh, voltage uh, uh, decrease. And if you times seven or seven uh, in series, that, that is comparable to the uh, battery that we have, then there will be a, already a uh, uh, more than seven volt uh, in, in terms of from the beginning to the end, there, there is a voltage difference of seven volt. And that is pretty big. So that means if uh, this material and this battery, if you use the capacity in this region, then uh, they will be uh, very close to the cutoff for the uh, inverter, that means for the UPS. And so there are some risks using this type of uh, battery for UPS applications. And there are more um, other potential problems. Second point I would like to tell about is that this is C rate. Uh, 1C and 2C, there is a voltage drop of 0 0.3 volt. If you times seven, that's about the uh, 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 2.1 uh, volt in terms of uh, voltage difference. And but for this battery, is less than one volt, much less than one volt. So that means that we call it polarization is uh, for layer structure. Uh, materials, batteries, it's more severe compared to lithium iron uh, species of uh, batteries. Okay, so um, then talk about the uh, performance. We talk about the uh, 
environment test because uh, these batteries are subjected to uh, an environment and that is uh, without air conditioning. Used to be air conditioning, but that's for lead acid batteries. But you want to save that money uh, for a long time. So it was uh, a cycle at 40 degrees Celsius and uh, the cycle life is expected to be uh, more than 1,000 at the uh, end of uh, the discharge, about 50%. Okay, so, um, and these standards are based on the uh, utilization of 15 years. Um, that means about 1,000 times of cycling. And there is one more intriguing experiment that's not directly related to this work, but it's high power durability test. So we use it uh, for 300 amp, three, th three seconds, um, and, and, the, and then the rest, and then the recharge. So it's charged longer time, about um, how many seconds? 40 seconds, and then discharge for three seconds, and then make it continuous. And uh, this is for mimicking the cranking condition. So we also use that for cranking the vehicles. So this battery module is 14, um, it's a, a 12 volt, 12 volt uh, a battery. And then uh, after 35 thousands of uh, cranking, it's still good. So it's pretty durable in that sense. So now we, tell a little bit why uh, is it capable for partial replacement. So um, it's a hierarchical uh, management. Um, if people can recall from the beginning. So uh, we have a hierarchical structure. So a lot of information or problems are already solved in uh, local battery modules and the only arrows will go to the uh, system. That's below. And then uh, we make the uh, building blocks as, uh, as a battery module, and that's the re repetition of uh, battery units and prevention of unnecessary communications. There is one type of uh, system that relies a lot on the communications and monitoring. And normally those monitorings will go all the way um, to the uh, uh, battery control. And so sometimes if the errors, uh, there are errors from the data or some miscommunications, the whole system can just shut down unnoticeably. There could be that kind of, of, of problem. But in our case, we are just repetition of uh, battery modules. So we prevent unnecessary communications that increases its reliability. And then also um, there is one big feature that's important that is easy for detection for replacement. So if there are some errors that's coming out from the battery module, how do you identify, how do you identify which module should be replaced? So in this battery module, we have uh, a LED light on top that tells you that this is the one that's, that gives you the uh, signal um, and should be replaced. And um, the very last is the uh, recycle processes. And uh, this is another big issue, and I'm not going to elaborate here, um, but this is actually very important. After long time service, um, how do you recover the battery modules? How do you separate the modules uh, to the battery cells? How do you separate the materials to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the, how do you basically, how do you disassemble those battery cells and recover the materials. And the important thing is that all the materials, uh, BOM, build of materials, are ro rose compliant. No lead, cadmium, uh, mercury, or chromium. See, uh, for lead acid batteries, although they claim they can recover uh, more than 98% of lead, but even that 2% of lead can be really detrimental because the, uh, it's, the allowance is about PBB level. <laughs> so, I mean, in this case, uh, these materials is, um, is very much uh, amenable for recovering and shouldn't be uh, uh, any toxic substances uh, generated during this recycling process. Final materials recovery can be either reused or used for some other applications. The very last uh, criteria for the uh, uh, system has to be considered is the stability of 
material source. And this is the uh, uh, cobalt uh, supply. So cobalt price is uh, fluctuating. Um, but for this uh, lithium iron phosphorus uh, system, since uh, iron is the uh, major element, so uh, when there is iron uh, 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 refining uh, uh, steel industries, there will be a source of iron. So there is abund abundant uh, abundancy of the material. So the source of material is not a problem. And that is very good when you, that is very important in the sense uh, when you are considering using this material, using these batteries for a uh, large scale applications, um, source is very important. You don't want any interruption of uh, any supply. Um, the very last uh, to this um, uh, criteria, uh, we have a, uh, a, a small comparison of uh, LFPO uh, versus uh, Verla. Verla is uh, as a battery, it's well regulated as a battery. Um, so the charging conditions, discharging conditions, and of course, uh, lithium ion battery is much better. And in terms of uh, safety, I just show no safety risks. And for the environment, uh, it's sustainable, but it's not the case for lead acid batteries. And in terms of uh, performance, there could be space saving, and this is phenomenal. So in uh, using our batteries, only one half of uh, uh, occupancy. So one half, so that is uh, uh, very critical for uh, the big companies. Uh, so the floor, uh, the, the, uh, the footprint is actually uh, very, very important to them. It's, it's equivalent to money. And then the weight is one third. And for the cooling, uh, I just said, we even show the 40 degree uh, continuous uh, uh, experiment uh, environment and it still cycles uh, well for 1,000 cycles. So uh, in terms of cooling, there is no need for uh, cooling because of uh, 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 just like what is necessary for lead acid battery. And life cycle expectancy for lead acid is about seven years. For this is uh, 15 years or more. Maintenance, lead acid batteries needs maintenance. So sometimes lead acid batteries uh, from the touch panel, whatever screen you see, the battery is there. But when you discharge it, it's not there. So that is uh, a noticeable shutdown uh, of uh, lead acid batteries. That's the biggest problem, lead acid batteries, not reliable. Um, but in this case, uh, uh, in our case, we don't need any uh, 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 specific um, uh, kind of uh, maintenance because we have the warning system. If there is problem, just go ahead and do some uh, swap and re replace. Okay, so that was the essential criterion to make the whole battery system work for the high power uh, applications. And now this is the second part that is, uh, what are the essential elements that's responsible for the system, for the system uh, success? The very first is the materials. Um, thermal runaway characteristics is directly related to the materials and it's already determined by the materials. So battery materials is very critical in that sense. And the second uh, uh, one is the, uh, the battery cells. And there are a lot of uh, design complications and formula, recipe, production issues about the battery cells, but I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, just pick out one that is a thermal stability and uh, the terminal structure. So when you are undergoing a high current discharge conditions, everything can be heated up. So in, including those terminals and those terminals is a direct reflection of the cell temperature inside. And if this temperature is too high, the uh, battery is going to rupture. And then the, uh, the balancing system, uh, the balancing system, when you have a highly series batteries, you, you want them to be, you want the whole system to give the uh, maximum uh, capacity. And that is, that is uh, the reason that you want uh, all batteries are fully charged and to their maximum capacity. If one is low, then pretty much you lose the capacity of the whole system and in some case there could be some safety issues. Um, so the uh, balancing system, how to keep the battery system, uh, battery system healthy, the balancing is very critical. 
then the single wire control, that's the system level of, uh, of, uh, of consideration. And then the very last is isolation of control and monitoring. And just recall a little bit, uh, the very beginning, the architecture, we separate the control and, we, and, uh, and, and the monitoring. So the monitoring is not going to affect the, uh, the problem that's detected by the control. Something has to be done immediately, then it will be done immediately. Will not wait until the monitoring tell you what is going on and then you do the activities too slow, just like a dinosaur. You hit the tail, takes 40 seconds to the brain, takes forever to take the action. It could be already very detrimental. Okay, so this is layer structure. Um, this is uh, my baby, my thesis. So layer structure materials. Um, so these are the oxygens and uh, these are the uh, lithium. Um, we call it uh, we call them uh, uh, the slabs. So these are repetitions of uh, slabs with uh, lithium in between. Um, and this is the uh, lithium iron uh, material that's currently used for this high power application. It's a uh, one dimensional intercalation compound because uh, it has only one channel uh, from left to right, okay, in whatever angles. Um, so there is, we, we call it one dimensional intercalation compound. And for this, you have X and Y directions for movement. So it's, we call it two-dimensional intercalation compound. So this structure is more rigid in the sense in comparison to these layer structures. It can undergo distortion when you extract the lithium out. Uh, when you extract the lithium out between those slabs, there, are, there is only metal wars force that's binding those slabs. So it's very likely for those materials to undergo phase transition to other more stable form. And that's the origin of thermal runaway. So uh, this is the, uh, um, a uh, very typical experiment that's showing um, how uh, uh, energy will be re uh, released, which is what I said. When lithium are extracted, when you heat the material, the material, if it overcomes this uh, uh, energy barrier, you will undergo uh, either transformation to other substances or decomposition. And this is the uh, consequence of the decomposition. The heat is generated. For this lithium cobalt oxide, it has uh, this much of uh, energy that's released. And for lithium nickel NCA, nickel cobalt aluminum, NMC, NMC is smaller, uh, but still there is a release in energy. And for LFP or LFPO, there is no, nothing released. And that tells you why when you overcharge the battery, it does not cause any thermal runaway problems. And uh, when I talk a little bit of uh, uh, the layer structure materials, I think, um, I think somebody asked me, I think it's probably Professor Zhang uh, uh, asked me, uh, why is cobalt necessary um, for uh, lithium uh, ion battery? So basically, this is a pure uh, nickel material. And we can find it's not very smooth. Um, there are some a little bit bumpy. And that's phase transition. If we make it, if we do a derivation of uh, the, uh, this plot, uh, the voltage and capacity plot, we would we find um, these peaks representing the play tall uh, uh, of uh, the previous plot, like the flat region. The flat region, you will see a peak. A peak. That the, the peak is the uh, actually uh, the phase of a coexisting phase. For for pure lithium nickel oxide, it undergoes uh, many many phase transitions. Pure lithium nickel oxide. This can be eliminated by adding cobalt, <laughs> okay? So that is stabilizing the phase is uh, very uh, important. And so uh, we had a uh, research using uh, pure uh, lithium nickel with the addition of uh, uh, magnesium and eventually we make it no phase transition at all. See, it's uh, um, sloping, but there is no plate tolls. That's, that's being shown. However, these layer structures still exhibit 
uh, different amount of uh, exothermic reactions when it is heated. So this is the result of uh, we try to make five different materials uh, with, a, uh, with a different amount of magnesium. And then we found um, the phase transition has been eliminated and then the uh, heat being released has been suppressed. Okay. So there are mechanisms in, in doing that um, uh, for stabilizing the uh, material, uh, for stabilizing the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the material. So we charge them to the same uh, voltage and we found um, with the addition of uh, magnesium to, uh, more, to about 20%, uh, there can be elimination of the uh, exothermic peak. And in fact, we also found um, the stabilization even if we the same amount of lithium out, um, still um, the one with magnesium stabilization is much less exothermic. And this is the uh, most recent progress we have. That's the, uh, this is the layer structure materials morphology, the, the material. We try to make it a composite of uh, nanomaterials. So we use this as the uh, precursor and then eventually we make a composite to make the uh, materials nano. Um, the reason to make the materials nano is that uh, the bulk diffusion is much slower in comparison to grain boundary diffusion. So, if, um, and also we need the phosphate to stabilize the material um, just because of structure reasons, just what I mentioned. Okay, the second criteria for the battery cell uh, is the battery cell. So today I'm going to not going uh, all the perspectives of battery cells, but instead uh, several things. Uh, electrolyte leakage should be minimized. So when terminal is used for uh, connecting the battery, then you can imagine if uh, 500 amp is passing through, it's going to make everything heated. So we want these penetrations of electrolyte, the path will be lengthened. So in that sense, the uh, leakage of uh, electrolyte can be minimized. And also the uh, terminals has to be big and, and should be uh, in good contact with the uh, other uh, current collector connectors to make the good contact between the terminal to the connectors to minimize its uh, uh, heat being generated. And this is a, a typical uh, test result uh, of uh, those batteries. Uh, when they are made, they are subjected to high current 320 amp for five minutes. Make sure that the temperature is low. If the temperature is high, that means uh, inside the battery, the separators can be melted and porosity can be reduced. So the high rate will be bad. So that means this battery is, is uh, damaged and not good for next time use. Then the uh, cell balance mechanism. So um, we just talk about this uh, layer structure. It's sloping in terms of uh, battery charge discharge plate tall. And for this lithium iron, it's more flat. So people used to use um, voltage for determining the cell equilibration. That means the voltage and capacity. There is one-to-one -one correspondence for layer structure materials, but it's not the case with lithium iron. So you can't use voltage because in determining the capacity difference. So if there is 0 0.1 volt in difference, there could be a very big um, uh, from full to empty kind of uh, uh, difference. So for this, uh, to make sure that all the battery cells are in uh, balanced condition, so we decide to control the cell capacity in some certain range. And so the battery cells are fluctuating and so in that sense, uh, in, in that case, we make sure that these batteries are in good, healthy uh, conditions like this. So you charge for the first time, second time, third time, fourth time, it goes up and down, up and down. This is one cell, particular cell, uh, use that for demonstration. So every time it will not go to the uh, only place, it will be fluctuating in certain range. And why is it important? The balance mechanism is not uh, conducted based on comparing cell to cell voltages. Certain amount of charge is withdrawn and uh, then uh, during the self-discharge condition is triggered. 
and then a truly balanced condition is voltage folding and uh, just what I just showed and this makes the battery flexible in being series and parallel and allowable for partial replacement. Okay, so when we talk about the, uh, uh, the battery modules, so inside, of course, there should be some electronics con for control and we have our own uh, integrated circuit. So basically this integrated circuit is going to monitor all those overcharge, over discharge, the uh, cell balance, the temperature issues. And if there are any needs for cutoff, then this goes to this one wire control. Um, some people call it dry contact, but basically if something wrong is happening, it, it's going to trigger uh, a relay that's connected. And those relays are connected in the series. So if any of them gets wrong, then it's going to detects the, uh, um, there is a, um, uh, a problem, that, that is a voltage difference. So this is, we call it a one wire control. And this one wire control is replacing the conventional data transmission. So you do not need a whole bunch of uh, data being transmitted and there could be some other interference problems and uh, this kind of design is going to make it really stable for 20 years of uh, service. And then uh, the very last um, essential element is that, just like what I mentioned, we make it um, a control and monitor separate. So um, this is the one wire control. So if there is any, anything wrong, then um, the UPS will stop charging and we'll ask people to come and do the inspection. And if there are any indication of uh, um, uh, uh, any light, for example, like if LED is bright, you know this is the one that has problem, just take it out. And most of the time, all those electronics are sleeping. And that is the reason we make it uh, uh, very reliable for 20, 20 years of use. And this view graphs tells you uh, that's the level of protections um, recalling those uh, safety results, we are telling you, even if all those system controls fail, what is going to look like. So if that is guaranteed to be safe, then uh, uh, plus we have all these uh, different levels of uh, protections that is going to minimize, m to make your product, uh, uh, to make the uh, whole system safe um, and the chance of having error is close to zero. Okay, so we have uh, different uh, protections. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, do you have any questions about the uh, UPS? High power systems? Yes, please. So we had the speaker yes. for a week before uh -huh. about Zing. Yes, Zing yes, so yes, yes. One of his arguments is that the zinc is stable. Stable, safe, stable, right? safe, yes. So, you know, somehow he indicated that, you know, lithium, the lithium yes. system is not as safe as it can Right, be. true. But at the same time, you are doing the UPS, right? So right, right, right. You know, what would, you know, how would you come? Actually, uh, I, I think uh, I checked the, uh, the performance test, uh, uh, the performance uh, data. Um, it's not yet the, the high rate I'm talking about. <laughs> this high rate is probably five, ten times bigger than that. I don't think uh, even lead as a battery is not safe. So, let, well, it's more similar to lead as a batteries. Okay? So, lead as a batteries, when it is subjected to a uh, big current, the electrolyte starts boiling. And, and then eventually the terminals melt it. So it's pretty ugly. So I believe if the performance is, is really high rate discharge, uh, like what I'm talking in this range, um, probably it's not as safe as said. But uh, like what I said, it's determined by the chemistry, the material itself. Whether the materials does offer that kind of capability, that's another problem. But as far as I understand, its performance is much lower compared to this one, okay? Five minutes. Okay, so uh, let me try to make it quick. Um, so this is a uh, energy uh, system for homes, 
and then uh, it's a uh, basically it's an inverter in combination with the uh, uh, with with the the battery. So and then it's uh, hooked up to all these appliances at home. So during the daytime, um, the uh, PV uh, input is going to give it give you the energy as the, uh, and, and can be used as a first priority when it is in combination with the battery. Um, so now, so this slide shows, now it's hooked up to um, these, uh, we, we call it a, uh, a, a power supply center. And in the beginning, it's connected to the grid and the PV. So during the daytime, in the morning, when it is under charging, the energy is coming from the PV, and that's that's pretty much you uh, make the the system uh, charge, make make the battery system charge. And at that time, the family is powered by the grid. But when it when the battery is fully charged, then the grid is off. So basically, you are using the PV as the power source, and the reservoir that's the battery. And the battery, since the battery is pretty high in power capability, so you do not need that big. So for example, if you have one kilowatt need uh, of uh, your uh, uh, appliance, you definitely need one kilowatt of uh, PV It's at its peak. But it's not always the, the case because sun is sometimes shiny, sometimes not. So at that time you need a reservoir, that's the battery, and that, it, that is how it works. And then, so combination of battery and PV, um, when sun sets, then that's about the time uh, when battery is drained to, let's say, less than 50%, then that's, the, that's about the time you activate the, uh, uh, the grid power. So this is the uh, typical um, data for the, the apparatus that I was introducing. So in the morning, so this is the uh, charging of the battery. You will see this is voltage. Voltage is increasing. And then these um, um, very wacky curves, that's the uh, uh, energy coming from the, the PV. So it's pretty unstable, actually. But it is used uh, for charging the battery. So uh, everything is stabilized in that sense. When battery is fully charged, then, like what I said, the uh, grid is cut. So at that time, uh, only the uh, uh, the PV is in combination with the uh, battery and to be the power system power of the homes until until some extent that um, it reaches its low end, let's say 30%, 20%, you name it. And during the night, there is a small recharge. So this is how the system works. Um, and then uh, I don't have much time. So... Okay, um, there is an animation, but um, science, since time is constrained, I, I'm not going to go through that. And then, so this is going to alleviate uh, the peak consumption. So if uh, many families are having appliances like this, then see the, uh, the, uh, the peak of valley is about 30%. Um, that's a typical case in Taiwan, 30%. Um, so, if we can use uh, the solar energy as a first priority, basically you do not need, there is a no need to, uh, to get more power plants because all those peak will be shaved and, and that is going to uh, reduce the impact to the environment for this kind of appliance. Okay, um, I don't have much time. This is the very recent demonstration of uh, this system. And uh, now I talk a little bit of uh, this project we had uh, at Cornell uh, about um, eight, 10 years ago. And what I want to say about this vehicle is that at that time, there are three modes of operation. One is the urban mode. That is used batteries only. And that's 60 miles capability, which covers 97 of, uh, percent of daily trips. So if you have, the question is that, do we need a, Big battery like Tesla. And as far as I understand, no, we do not need that big battery uh, uh, that Tesla is, is using. Um, so 60 miles of traveling capability covers 97. 
So if it's uh, 20 miles, it actually only covers how many percent? 3% only. So that is going to go through the second mode. That's extended mileage mode. Uh, it's a combination of a battery plus engine, diesel engine, and can be a fuel cell in the future. In, in the future. Need a continuous operation of the engine when it is cranked up and then make the engine steady state operation. And it's about 15 kilowatt or less for the continuous driving of 60 miles per hour. Um, there is other uh, um, severe case that's climbing, but it's, I'm not going to elaborate more here on to time constraint. So this is uh, simple calculations that tells you that um, this is the uh, dragging, the wind drag, and the rolling resistance. That's the source of energy consumption for vehicles. And for a 60 miles cruising for 1.4 ton of, uh, of vehicles, it's, uh, if we increase, if we make this rolling resistance, assume it's really high, it's only 15 kilowatt hour. Uh, 15 kilowatt hours. So, I mean, the uh, power is actually 15 kilowatt. So it's about 20 horsepower. So we actually, we're not using a lot of uh, power uh, when the vehicle is cruising. There's one thing. When to crank on the engine, uh, there is one uh, very big catch that is you want it to be cranking on at the uh, highest uh, efficiency. This is brake specific fuel consumption. And this R is the fuel consumption. This P is the torque, is the pressure, is equivalent to the torque. So you want this R to be very small. So you can see from this view graph, um, it's smallest under some RPM like 2000 and then with certain torque, uh, not too high, not too low, but appropriate. So that is the way you make the engine uh, in the highest efficiency. For a diesel engine, it's about 44, that's its maximum. So if we have a 44 efficiency, when we're using fossil fuels, and if it's 44% uh, percent efficiency and no transmission loss, it's probably a good idea to have that either embedded in home community or in the vehicle because it's efficient enough. Eventually, when you have an electric car, you still need a coal power plant. It's 35% in efficiency. So that does not really make sense. So you want something that is a steady state um, at a very low uh, energy consumption. And this is the very last view graph of today's talk. That is the hybrid uh, system. So um, combining the, uh, the home energy system that I was introducing, that is the PV that comes in with the, uh, the battery. So when battery is charged, then the whole system relies on the PV and the battery only. Now, and assuming that it's similar to the vehicles, that covers 97% of daily scenarios. So, but there will be a, a power off uh, during the year. I, I believe that is less than 3%, just like the vehicles. That's about the time you need a engine. You need a diesel engine. And that diesel engine has to be operated at a uh, most efficient condition. And so, if that is the case, then uh, uh, this is the, uh, for example, this is the daily cons uh, uh, power consumption of a home or a building, okay? And so um, if this is the power capability that's provided by the engine, which is in its steady state operation efficiency, let's say 44%, then when uh, engine cranks up, that is going to give you some power, plus some power that is provided by the battery. So this integration of this area will be the energy that is needed from the battery. And that is the reserve that you want for the battery. The, the very first part I talk about for the energy saving, uh, the home energy saving system, you want some reserve, and that reserve is for this purpose, and that is, um, you, you want a reserve that covers um, any emergency use and assume there is a peak. So um, this is the energy that is, needs to be reserved uh, from the battery. And this is the uh, power that's coming from the diesel engine or whatever uh, fossil fuel uh, energy converter. And 
by balancing that. That's the way you make the whole building uninterrupted forever. Okay, not just energy saving, but uh, also gives you the flexibility of uh, standalone with highest efficiency of everything. Okay, so a little bit of a closing mark. Uh, I, I believe uh, energy technology is comprehensive and interdisciplinary, and uh, uh, we should utilize elaborate thinking and make things solutions in the simplest way, and that is based on good understanding. And hybrid solutions could uh, lead to maximizing the renewable energy being accepted and uh, to have uh, some real influence for uh, future use uh, could be the hybrid solutions. And then, uh, although those technologies are important, we talk about today, but we still need to think about the, the criticality uh, that's from the production and quality, supply chain, et cetera, to make the energy technologies viable for future use. Okay, um, these are the uh, applications we've been successful. I can't cover all of them in one time. Thank you. We have time for about three or so questions. One of the things that surprised me mm -hmm. is that you were able to achieve such great safety specs yes. without Thank touching the electrode. Ah, right. So when I so when I yes. think about overcharge, yes. 